This is lesson number three. We're in Genesis chapter 1, 6 through 13. We are going to start today with day two. In other words, we've already had two lessons just covering day one. And today we're going to cover day two and day three. We're speeding up. And aren't you excited? So we're going to get this uh, ball rolling and it's going to roll downhill pretty fast as we get to go. We're we're Genesis chapter one, verse uh, verse six. And what has happened in the very first day, the Lord uh, created all the heavens, as you remember, everything there, all the angels and everything there. And he, and he hung this ball, and I got a picture of it over there on the screen, out in, out in what we would call space. He hangs this ball. It's covered with water. But also we know that this ball that's covered with water has a core down inside of it that we will call land pretty quick here in in the next in the third day we're going to call it land it's underneath that water and there's this huge huge deep ocean that's just covering everything on this earth and that finished well that didn't finish the uh, towards at the the next thing that the lord does is he throws out what we're going to call a gush of energy remember i led you through that The scripture says, let there be light, and there was light. But the real translation of that is, let there be a gush of energy, and there was energy, okay? Uh, We use the word light, and that's in last week's lesson. Those lessons are online. Go and catch that so we don't have to go into that. Uh, That's that's a good lesson. Go listen to that lesson. Today's lesson is actually better than last week's lesson, if, if you ask me. And by the way, next week's lesson is even better than this one. But we're going to do it the next time we get together, two weeks from now, all right? So um, this water that is covering is depicted like here in, in, uh, in figure number 12. Uh, on purpose, I have cut a slice through this water. And um, uh, hang on a second. Let me make this thing work. Go. There we go. There we go. I've cut a slice to this water, and you see that darkness. That darkness is the land. That darkness is there, and the rest of that is water that's covering it all around. And if you remember last week, I told you that slice that I have there is actually the size of what the land and the water surface will be when God separates the waters from the top and from the bottom. Um, As we look in today's lesson, we're going to focus on this dividing of the water. This water's out there, it's huge. It, 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 it's way past. It goes up hundreds of miles above where we are today. Hundreds, we're, we're standing on the surface of the earth, and had we been there at this point in time in the story, hundreds of miles of water would be covering us above our heads. So we pick up in verse 6, and it says, Then God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. Now that's kind of hard to understand. How do you separate waters from waters? It's a Hebrew thing. It's the way they say it. Just hang on, okay? Verse 7, And God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And so it was. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning a second day. So the only thing that's happening on day two is the Lord is taking this hundreds of miles of water and he's dividing it in two. And some of it is going to become what we call the ocean. And some of it is going to be called the expanse. And the expanse is going to have a name attached to it, which is called heavens. That's the way they used to say it before we had a word that is a better word that we understand. And that word is the word atmosphere. For every reason, this word here which says the expanse was called heaven could accurately say the expanse was called heaven atmosphere and it would be absolutely correct when we see the word heaven we think of heaven where we want to go not what it's talking about here it's talking about this atmosphere that is around us and so when the lord separated the waters 
According to this passage, there's this expanse. There's a, the word expanse is not a good word in English for what's being held, uh, said here. Now, if you remember also in the King James, it doesn't use the word expanse. It uses a different word. So those of us who are from the King James age, what was the word that it was used there? Firmament. Firm. Mean, seeing the word firm means something that is firm. The, the, the Hebrew word, the way we would spell that, the sound of the Hebrew word in English is raga, R-A-G-A. It means solid, solid. What the Lord is saying here is above these lower waters, there's going to be the upper waters, and it is a solid, invisible, permanent area that can never be changed. Catch that? It's not solid in that it's like this piece of wood or a piece of steel. <clears throat> it's solid in that it can never be filled up with water again, with ocean again. The oceans will never go hundreds of miles above the surface of the land again because all of that that is made in that solid area that expands the atmosphere as we know it is going to be permanent and remain and will never be changed and the ocean waters can never ever fill it up again. It was water to begin with. It was seawater to begin with. Uh, it, it, it had all the same content that our seawater has today, <clears throat> but it just went all the way up for hundreds of miles. That is being changed in an instant at the spoken word of the Lord. And so, it is interesting in God's wonderful ecology of how He made the earth and everything and made this atmosphere. And see, there's the picture there. Uh, that one, the, I need to turn off the lights to see it. This one's a little bit better. It's, if you would look at the examples on your notes, you'll see the ball at the top in, in figure 11 the ball there with the cutout in figure 12, and you would say, hey, those two balls are the exact same size. Looks like it, doesn't it? But then you say, okay, figure 13. Now that's smaller than the other two. No, it's not. If you were to take that figure and set it right on top of 12, you'll notice that the edges of that blue, faded blue, that's fading out and thinning out, is exactly the same size as before what the Lord has done as an example he has taken that waters above and he has transformed it into what we call atmosphere needed for us to be able to breathe and the plant life will be needed to be able to breathe and to live also and so in God's wonderful plan and we're spinning out here a little bit he is going to allow the waters that are below in that blue, that blue represents the ocean. The black in the middle represents the land that has not poked through the ocean yet. It's still a ball in there. It's not been reformed yet. That does not happen until day three, and we're on day two. We're on day two, and that ball of land is still there. There's the ocean, and then from the dark blue going out or the light blue, he's changed that ocean water into something else that we call the atmosphere. All right. So on page 14 of our notes, it's interesting. And here it is. I've got it on the board for you over here. <clears throat> the atmosphere is made up and has within it some dissolved gases. Dissolved gases. It is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then 1% of other dissolved gases. Okay? Well, so while we're here, let's just look here. interesting. Down in the ocean, in the waters, when you go out into the ocean, the ocean has these dissolved gases in them too. It just so happens that it has 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. Do you notice any similarity between the atmosphere and the ocean? Isn't that pretty interesting? Okay. Now, on top of that, interesting enough, these dissolved gases 
have to be attached to something. Do you know what they have to be attached to? Fred, what do they have to be attached to? Water, H2O. They have to be attached to moisture. Now, folks, you don't realize it, but there's moisture in the air all around us. It is all, you do not want to live in a totally dry area. There's moisture all over creation. And, and that moisture is carrying the nitrogen and the oxygen. I did not know until, you know, I guess I probably did know because I did go through chemistry and biology and everything in school. But these were things that were not a means to the end of which I was going at the time. And so biology and chemistry was not really important to me until I have to realize how God made stuff. And that's when it became important about six months ago to me. <laughs> And I started searching this out and sending notes out to everybody going, people who really know, you know, we've got some rocket scientists in this church. We got some great chemists in this church. We got great biology folks and all of that in this church. Started sending out notes to say, is this true? Is this true? Is Google really right on this? You know, is this, are they telling us the truth? And, and I got the responses and the, and the answer is yes, this is true. And so in God's infinite wisdom, he took a whole chunk of that ocean water and he turned it into what we know as atmosphere with 28 percent i mean 78 percent dissolved nitrogen i didn't know i was snorting nitrogen every breath i took i'm thinking isn't that what they use in some cars to make them go faster and the answer is true the answer is true you you know we have a we have a company that um, the Lord has put together that employs many people. And I almost hate to name the company, but I am. I'm going to give them a plug. Their name is Air Laqui. Okay. And they, they split off and they take all these gases and they sell these gases. Do you know where they get those gases? Out of the air. It's just free raw product that they're just bringing this air in. And I understand that they freeze it down to like something, something degrees. And then as they're, as they're warming it up, different gases off gas, and they pull that off as they're somehow. And I don't even understand that, okay? That is way above my pay grade. But... <laughs> Everything, if you like to, if you like to um, uh, work with acetylene, you know, it's one of those gases they pull off. If you need oxygen, for, you know, to help you get around every day, it's one of those gases they pull off. You know, we just don't get oxygen out, you know, it's just one of these things. They do it on a big scale. And just a little bit, 21% of the oxygen, we have to have oxygen. By the way, oxygen's the bad boy. Oxygen is what causes everything to rust. The thing you need to live is what also causes everything to rust. And don't tell anybody, but it's also what causes you to rot when you die. Now, how did God do that? That's not even today's lesson. But how is it that oxygen is the bad thing that causes everything to rot? I'm not even going there. And don't expect the answer to that in a lesson. Because it's not there yet unless I decide to put it in. In the infinite wisdom of our scientists, they have tried to explain to us this atmosphere. And they've done it by carving out layers. Well, kind of like what I had said to you before on the... Um, trying to describe that gush of energy that the Lord put out on the first day that causes everything to move, everything to work, everything to be held in place. Probably in the big story, when we all get to heaven, we'll find out that these layers that, that they are talking about here may not even be truly accurate in how they describe them. There may be some other little things. In fact, some of the scientists now have added other layers inside of these layers. They, they call them like a, like a um, troposphere pause in between the troposphere and the stratosphere. It's a pause. 
Well, maybe they've got a different definition from pause than, than I do. I don't understand that. I read through it. I still don't understand it. Some of y'all think that's the way it is with your Sunday school lessons. <clears throat> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I just got to mention your name. We can't go a class without mentioning your name. That's right. And when you're not here, everybody will know you're not here because I have not mentioned your name. Yes. But your name is written down in glory. Yes, it is. You don't. Thank goodness. <laughs> Let's look at these areas, these layers. By the way, that graphic there was one fun thing to make on a, on a computer program that I've used to get it right. Um, the first layer around the earth is called the troposphere. Now, you don't need to know much about this except for, oh, remember this. This, this it says layers of the atmosphere as designated by scientists. The next part is real important, not to scale. Okay, that's real important. Because this atmosphere, this troposphere, is half of the atmosphere. About half. It's a lot, lot. Okay, it's a whole bunch of it. In this uh, first layer, that's where all the clouds are. That's where the thunder and lightning and, and all of that stuff uh, occurs. If there's no clouds, we say, look up, say, we have clear, clear skies today. Really what we're looking at is this troposphere part. The second layer is called the stratosphere. And um, some of y'all have gotten so mad that you've blown your tops into the stratosphere. You've ever heard that said? Because my dad used to say that. I, he said, son, you're getting so mad that you're blowing your top into the stratosphere. And he was right. And he died before I was 11. I mean, I was 11 when he died. So I didn't even know they knew about stratospheres back in the 60s and that time. But I guess they did. He, 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 the stratosphere is up there. And it's kind of interesting uh, because that's the layer where most of us know where the jets fly. Why do our commercial jets fly in the stratosphere? Because it's much more stable than down in the troposphere. Troposphere's got all the clouds and everything. That's not to say that clouds don't go up into the stratosphere because there are huge thunderstorms where those thunderheads grow up and all of you who have been on airplanes very much, you have been riding along thinking everything was nice and smooth and all of a sudden it got rough at 35,000 or 40,000 feet or wherever you are, and you thought, whoa, whoa, what was that? That was a thunderstorm pushing through the troposphere into the stratosphere, and so the, the, the clouds do build up into that, but most of the time this area is very stable. The next thing that's very interesting about the stratosphere, it has the largest concentration of O3 in all of what we call Earth and its atmosphere and its oceans. O3. What's O3? Ozone. It is the largest and highest concentration of ozone. And ozone is not something you exactly want to breathe. It, it, it can be dangerous, all right? And so ozone is there. But what's interesting about ozone is ozone, you've heard everything about the ozone layer. You know, you know, you know, your cars are damaging the ozone layer. Your hairspray is damaging the ozone layer. Your everything else in creation is damaging the ozone layer. Why is it damaging the ozone layer and what does it matter? It matters because the ozone layer protects us because it absorbs the radiant energy from UVB, as in boy, rays. Those are the bad boys. Those are the ones that when you get sun rays, the UVB as in boy, rays from the sun, those are the ones that causes you to burn and to causes you to have skin cancers. The UVA rays, A and B, the UVA rays, eh, they're okay. They're not, they're not bad. They're not bad. But the UVB, the Lord has put a protection for us up there from the rays of the sun that he's going to create on another day, by the way, on the fourth day. Not going to get to that till next week. On the fourth day, he's putting a protection layer there to protect everything from the UVB rays. Those rays just don't damage you as a human. They damage animals. They damage plants. They damage everything, okay, that they get through. And so the Lord's put this protection of the UV, these O3, into that layer. We call it a layer. It just happened to be floating there. And... 
and that is there for our protection. So we asked the question, where in the world did the O3 come from? It was in the seawater. It's one of those gases that's in the seawater when he splits it apart. Now look, we're going up to layer number three. Layer number three is called the mesosphere. And that layer, that's the layer that is kind of interesting. Whenever you see a, what we call a falling star, usually that's not a star that's falling. Usually that's a piece of meteorite or a piece of rock that is coming through our atmosphere, headed towards us, and when it hits this layer, the mesosphere, the mesosphere is also called the sodium layer. Where did we get the sodium? The sodium is in the salt water that got split off. All right? When this, these, this rock or meteor uh, hits that sodium, the friction of hitting begins it to burn and whatever. And when it goes through the ozone layer, the ozone layer also helps it. And by the time it comes through, it is either gone or whatever. We see that through these two layers, mesosphere and stratosphere. Now, what's interesting to me is we go up to the very next level, and the next level, the fourth layer, is called the thermosphere. The thermosphere is just for understanding of where we are. The shuttle traveled in the lower parts of the thermosphere. The space station is in the lower parts of the thermosphere. Okay? What's really, really interesting to me and scary at the same time is that we have evidently and I've seen pictures of it now, and what they do, an agency that watches all the trash that is in space. And it is a bunch of trash. And so some of that trash is exploded things here and old space stuff here and all that. And just think about this. Sometimes you see a shooting star as we might call it but it might be a nut or a bolt that's coming back down through the mesosphere the sodium level and the ozone level to be burned up as it comes through that's amazing to me we have this um this uh organization that watches all this stuff and lo and behold now i know and have learned that when certain pieces of trash are headed towards the space station, the space station moves up and down or changes its position to be missed by the trash that's traveling at how many thousands of miles? Anybody got an idea, Fred? Pit typically about 17,000 miles an hour. Well, I don't know if you've ever traveled at 17,000 miles an hour, but it's a little fast. And the impact of that is a little fast. The example of that is go to the top of the Empire State Building where you can go out where there's a little fence and you can look out. And if you drop a penny off of it, it will go two inches into the concrete. A little bit of speed. Just a penny. Two inches in the concrete. Yes, sir. Yes. Had what? A paint fleck. So they're they're watching paint fleck trash. They didn't catch this one. Well, I do know that they have some pictures of one that the timing to move the lab up did was too quick, and they went into one of the pods or whatever to eject. They put on their suits and everything and waited it out just hoping, and they've got major damage. Yes, sir, Dave? Yeah, um, on the space shuttle, when it was flying one time, uh -huh. it collided with the paint chip and let the nick in the uh, wind, forward window. That's what, is that what you're talking about? The forward window. And the, and the, it, yeah, yeah, three quarters of the way through a window that's how thick? Oh, just about this thick? Yeah, yeah. That's bulletproof on Earth, by the way, okay? Bomb-proof, maybe. That's pretty interesting.
Well, we're in this troposphere that's kind of interesting here because, and this is not to scale, about 124 miles, up to about 124 miles above the Earth's surface. You start here, and it's 90-something degrees outside. And as you go up, it gets colder and colder and colder and colder, up to about 124 miles, about. I actually saw a few different mileages on that. But when you get past that, they call it the thermosphere because up there, it can get above that, can get up to 1,830 degrees. That means when we went to the moon, we had to be prepared with a, a vessel, as we might call it, or a ship that could transcend through the 1,830 degrees without dissolving. 1,830 degrees. That would mess up baked potatoes in your oven pretty quick, okay? 400 for about an hour is okay. But 1,830, I'm not sure you could get them in and out quick enough. That's just how hot it is. And then you go into the fifth layer, which, by the way, we have scientists who say that layer is, does not exist. That fifth layer is the uh, exosphere. And uh, they tell us that there is air there. It's just really thin. I would not advise you to try to step out of a spaceship in the exosphere area and try to breathe any of that air, if it is there. Some scientists say it doesn't exist because that is already getting into the vacuum of space, and if there is a particle of air there, whatever you call it, it's so hard to find, you can't find it very often, because in that area, in fact, up in the thermosphere area, um, that thermosphere area, a molecule can go for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles before it hits another molecule, in fact. And, and also, uh, what happens is, is there's so few molecules of anything up in the thermosphere that there is, uh, the, the, there's nothing really there to absorb the energy from the sun, and that's the reason why it gets so hot. Well, back on the exosphere there, it is right at the edge of the... Uh, 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 vacuum of space and because there's virtually nothing there a particle can, dry, can fly at ballistic above ballistic speeds faster than a bullet could ever go or whatever for hundreds and hundreds of miles before it ever collides with anything pretty interesting and so our scientists have tried and we're going on now to page 13 our scientists have tried to um Page 15, I'm sorry. Our scientists have tried to, to describe that, and that's what it is, but it's really distorted what is happening in the story here. The story is, is God has taken the waters, He's divided them in half, and the top waters He's made into atmosphere, which He has layers that are actually for our protection and for the protection of the earth. Not only that, we've got the electromagnetic stuff that's going on that we talked about uh, last week. All this is for our protection. All this is for us. So here, there's some interesting things. In this atmosphere, and this is in your notes, I don't have it on the board or anyplace else. In, in your notes, what's interesting is, up there, or here, seawater, seawater has 96.5% H2O, or water. It has, um, the other 3.5% is salt compounds made of 55% chloride, 30.6% sodium, 7.7% sulfate, 3.7% mag uh, magnesium, 1.2 calcium, 1.1 potassium, 0 0.07 of other chemicals. Well, lo and behold, well, look, there's our sodium content. We got our ozone. We got all this it's coming down through. It's there. It's in the seawater. And the Lord has seen fit to take a portion of that seawater and turn it into this atmosphere so we can breathe when life is here and we can live on it when it's here. So he's without the Lord changing a portion of that water into atmosphere, um, Nothing could live here. Nothing could live here. But the Lord knows what He's doing. He's doing a great thing in His creation. He really is. So amazingly, amazingly, this is one of these things that I've asked, and I said, is this really true? 
every drop of water in the ocean, every drop of water, may I say it like this, every molecule of water that's liquid, you know, it's, it's heavy, it's sitting down there in our oceans or down in our bays or in our rivers, eventually gets evaporated and goes up into the atmosphere and attaches to some stuff out there like nitrogen or maybe even oxygen, which we breathe in, and so that drop of seawater comes through us, and we use it, or it latches on to some more and drops down to water the earth. Once we get the earth, we hadn't got the earth till the next day. And then it makes its way back down to the oceans to start the process again. It makes into a vapor, comes up, clouds, moisture, grabbing on, and comes down. And yet, that firmament, that expanse, that atmosphere can is using the same elements and everything that the ocean is using, but in a different way, and that can never be changed. Our atmosphere can never be changed. Do not ever worry about our atmosphere being able to be blown up to where there will be no atmosphere on earth. It is a promise from the Lord. It can never be changed. It's not going to ever fill up with water. It's not ever going to go away. It's there. It is there. One reason is it's a world without end. On men, on men, according to Scripture. This world will go on after the Lord's holy city comes to dwell on, be on this earth at the end of the Bible story. And the plants and the other animals besides humans are still in their animal and plant life just as they are today. It's just that humans will be in glorified bodies here with those animals and everything. We never see that the animals change or that plant life changes. We don't see that. And so this process repeats. I, quite possibly, have breathed some air that once was water down off of um, Australia. Or England. Or heaven forbid, Louisiana. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, um, we're not there yet, and that's in chapter 5 and 6, and you just got to wait for that. All right, we're not, we're gonna, we're not going to chase any rabbits here. I'm chasing way too many rabbits already. All right, but they're good rabbits. We're going to cook those. And when we get to that one about Noah, we'll chase that one. All right, verse 9 picks up and says, Then God said, Let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So remember that core down underneath? He's going to make it into, he's going to cause that core down in the middle, underneath all that water that's still ocean. He's going to move those oceans into one place and he's going to reform that inner core of what we'll just call dirt for now and make it poke out of the water. So it pokes out, reforms it. Forms it in different shapes so water has place to go down and it can stick out. All right. Uh, look, look on your page, uh, figure 15. I've got a picture of that. You notice that you can see the United States and Canada there, and you can see part of South America. It's got it sliced open. See part of Africa, and Africa and United States, Canada, North America, South America, they're in black. They're in black on purpose because that's just black. That's just dirt. It's whatever color it is. It's just dirt. It has nothing alive on it yet. It's just dirt. It's just there. It's that middle core that's pushed out. Now, it's got energy because God gave it energy on the first day. He pushes it out. And you see how that nice little circle, a ball that was there, has now got a different shape to it, okay? I would like to think that down inside of our core of our earth that it was just a big old ball of stuff, but it can't be. It has to have a different shape to it. It has been full because the, the depths of our oceans are different. The depths of our valleys are different that are in the oceans. The, the, uh, the tectonic lines, down at the very bottom in the, the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, we have a tectonic line that runs through it. It's, a, it's really a river. It's like a river. And what's interesting is the scientists tell us that 
from California to Japan is getting closer every year by about five inches. And Florida to Portugal is getting further away every year by about five inches, which means the world is expanding apart and turning around. However, it may be depending on where you are a little more or a little less because up above us, we have mountains that are growing in height every year. We call it the continental shift. And as the continent's moving, remember at the equator, at the equator, this earth is spinning at 1,034 miles per hour. I guess it's going the other way. 1,034 miles per hour. But in Anchorage, Alaska, it's only spinning at 503 miles per hour. Why is it spinning so slow in Anchorage? Because the circle, the latitude circle, is smaller there than it is down here. So if the world is coming to the end and you don't want to be thrown off this world at 1,034 miles per hour, move to Alaska, it's half as fast. As if that would make any difference in the world, okay? And by the way, do not worry about the world coming to an end. It's not coming to an end because the scripture says, world without end, amen. Okay, it's not coming to an end. All right, all right. So, he's, pull, he's reforming that. And those tectonic plates, we've got them and we know where they are. Mm, but what's interesting... Remember it said that the Lord said, let the oceans pull into one place and let the dry land come into another place. Okay, there are theologians, there are theologians and there are scientists who believe that the dry lands were all in one place at one time. There's a very interesting thing out there also. If we could drop the sea levels about 30 to 50 feet, we would actually see that where we think are the ocean edges just dropped a little bit and went way on out there before they went like this, okay? You know, there's that place where you go out... Uh, Perfect example, some of y'all have been to Galveston. Galveston Bay is not really a good example, but been to Galveston Bay. You walk out from Galveston, you know, where you can make sure you can, you can still see one of the restaurants you're supposed to come back to later on to meet your family, you know, and you walk out, and it goes a little deeper, and then you, it comes back up, and you walk out some more, and it goes a little deeper, and it's green water all the way out. Actually, it's not green. It's just downright muddy. Because that's just the way it is. And then way out there, several miles and several miles out there, all of a sudden there is a drop-off. And this drop-off goes a long ways. Okay? If you get to where that drop-off, and we drop the water down where you can see that, you'll see that the shape of Galveston and around and the, and the Gulf of Mexico is a little different shape than what we know from the shoreline where the water comes up. It's got a different shape. And so what the scientists believe is that one day in the past, all the land was together. So does anybody recognize what this flower is? Do you recognize that? Okay, let me help you. This is one of the examples. You have some on your, in your lesson on page 16. You have another example. This is really difficult to do. Because the earth is a ball. And I'm trying to show you something on a flat. This actually rolls up together and rolls around. Which means this right here almost touches this right here. And this right here almost touches this right here. In other words, the top of the Canadian up in that line, actually because it's round and it's curved up, and we don't have many miles, this is touching. And that is the answer why scientists are saying we have found frozen, uh, not frozen, we have found ferns, uh, fossils of ferns that are in the very top part of this Siberian, whatever, Russian, all that kind of stuff in China, all this area here that are also over here in the top part of the uh, Canadian, all that kind of stuff, uh, Arctic Circle, 
that they only grow up here, they don't grow down here, but we don't have those ferns anymore. So nobody transplanted them. In other words, the circle was together enough to where those plants could grow for a period of time before they died and turned and the rocks and sludge and stuff moved over and turned them into fossils. Okay, so let me help you. This is a good example. This right here, this is, this is Antarctica. This is basically what it looks like underneath all the ice. It moved, they say, some theologians say that when Noah, I'm sorry, I'm going to Noah, but for purpose, okay? When Noah, when the flood happened with Noah, and the scripture's going to say the Lord caused the oceans of the deep to burst forth, okay, to cover the world with water. Does it cover up into the atmosphere? Not totally, because they can still breathe, but cover the world with, with water. It caused the Lord separated the the earth at that point in time. We're going to get to that when we get into that passage. So Antarctica goes here. Let's see if I can pull this one off. Australia ends up over here. And, just a minute, got to do this. Okay. Does that look familiar? There are some models that actually say that this right here where the Suez Canal is now with the Red Sea, this part actually at one time fit on top of this, and it was actually even closer together. So there are different models on that. And so the closest <clears throat> that right now that the Atlantic Ocean, the Americas, North America, is to uh, Europe is 1,470 miles. That's at its closest. Now, when you get down here, it's 4,000 miles. But remember, this is down at the equator. I never realized, with all of my poor education, that the equator runs right across here. Okay? Which means most of the continents of the world that inhabit a lot of people are north of the equator. All right? I need to move that up just a little bit because it's actually about right here. Okay, but it's down in here. So at the bottom, this can be 4,000 miles apart. But every year, it is moving more uh, about five inches, at least at the closest place. We know that there are tectonic plates. We know why the movement is happening. The plates are doing this, by the way. And then we have way over here, we have the one that's right down the middle of the, Atlantic, of the Pacific, or it could be over here, because we know the Pacific is being on this side of us, so there's a plate over here. Those plates on this side are moving on top of each other. The plate right here is moving apart. The Atlantic Ocean is getting deeper. The Pacific Ocean is getting shallower as the plates come in. Now, that's not shallow enough for you to go wade in. And how they know these things, I don't know. Well, that's what they say. Now remember, you look here. You see on our example, on figure 17, the North America, South, uh, uh, Eurasia, and Africa, those are all in black. Why are they all in black on my example? But you see the next example on 18, you'll see that they're in green. Why? Verse 11. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. Planting plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind with seed in them. They've got fruit. It's it's day three, by the way. The second day's over. We've split this. We've, we've got this earth up here that ends day, day two. Now we're on day three. Day three, he's putting vegetation everywhere. And he goes on to say, with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning a third day. Did you notice what he didn't say on day two? He didn't say it was good because he wasn't finished yet. But on day three, it's good. Now, 
when I read this as a kid and listened to preachers preach, I always thought, oh, the Lord just planted a little seed over here and it had to grow and start spreading. And he planted a tree over here, a little sprig, and it had to grow. No, that's not the way it was. Everything on the first day and all the land turned green on the first day. Immediately upon his word, the trees were there. The mighty redwood trees in California were there. The cedars of Lebanon were there. The tall pine trees of East Texas were there. The, um, the grasses, the, all the different types of grasses, the wheats and the, and the oats and all that type of stuff were there and they were covering everything. The fungus was there, the mushrooms and all that type of stuff. The plants, all the different plants, every plant that you have ever thought about buying and putting in your yard was there on that day in mature form so that let's say there's an apple tree and there were apple trees on that third day an apple tree allowed its apple to fall off the ground fully mature fully mature that apple fell off the ground to rot and those seeds to go back into the ground to replenish to grow another tree but it didn't matter because there's lots of apple trees. And we have plants in every stage of life on that day. Now comes the hard thing for me to understand. But it is true. It is a true thing. Hard thing for me to understand. Scientists tell us that the plant kingdoms do not need any form of animal life to survive. That they do not need any form of animal life to survive. We think we, we breathe and we let off carbon dioxide to feed the, the plants. They don't need our carbon dioxide because they put off enough carbon dioxide themselves to feed themselves. And lo and behold, what do plants do? Plants, all plants, be it fungus or the sequoia, uh, sequo um, what's the tree in California? Sequoia. sequoia tree in California, which is, by the, by the way, the largest mass of an organism in, that we know in the world is the sequoia. It's not the tallest tree, but it's the largest mass of a tree around. The largest single organism is in Oregon, in the world, it happens to be in Oregon, and it's called the honey fungus, and it covers 3.4 square miles, and it's all attached to the same, it's all part of the same root system. It is the largest fungus. The next largest organism is in Utah, happens to be in the United States, and it is a whole huge several mile field of trees that are all sprouting up from the roots of the same tree and they're all connected together it's the second largest organism of course the largest the largest as we know today the largest water animal is going to be the whale the largest land animal is going to be the elephant and there's all this other type of stuff we got these large things all right but on that day when everything was put out there plants by their dying and their decaying process, produce enough carbon dioxide to feed all the rest of the plants that are ever are going to live. Plants take in carbon dioxide and they convert it, convert it with energy from the sun through a process called photosynthesis into sugars. So when you go out to your little garden and you pick up some of the sugars out there, what are you picking up? Let's say it's butter lettuce or romaine lettuce or kale or spinach or poke salad or any of that stuff. What is being oh, strawberries, uh, peaches, apples? You're picking up sugars. We call them carbohydrates and when they die and fall off they turn back into compost which puts off carbon dioxide which starts the whole process again in other words the bad news is is you're not needed to make the trees grow and the plants and the honey fungus and the, the all the mushrooms 
and uh, anything that's out there, the, the moss, the grass, then you do not need it. We're not needed. It happens in the ocean waters and it happens outside the ocean waters. We are not needed. But wait a minute. They couldn't have taken carbon dioxide and made it on this day had the Lord not created energy on the day before. You follow it? On the first day. Actually, it happened on the first day, two days before. So everything that follows each day of creation is, re is relying on what happened the previous day. It all depends and relies on the previous day. So, God looks at it, and He says, It is good, and that ends the third day. Well, we pick up from there. And we go right into the next thing that happens on the fourth day. Seems like there's a sun and there's one moon around the earth with the atmosphere. And you see a bunch of stars. But you don't have the lesson for that. So I'll see you next time when we talk about that lesson. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. For your love for us and for your word. And lo and behold, thank you that our scientists, with everything they find out, come down to prove that what you said in your word is accurate and true. In your name, amen and amen.